So it's becoming pretty commonplace nowadays to hear calls that prominent people get, so to speak, canceled or uh, their, in the, their support uh, is taken away, they're shamed and so on for uh, some actions or views that they hold, which people find objectionable. That's pretty common. Uh, but I have to say I was uh, particularly surprised and uh, shocked to see a New York Times uh, opinion piece um, call, and, and the title of which was, Should We Cancel Aristotle? Uh, as a specialist in Aristotle's philosophy, uh, I was particularly uh, triggered, <laughs> so to speak, uh, and I couldn't help reading that article. Uh, the, the, art, the author, uh, Agnes Callard, she's an associate professor of philosophy at University of Chicago, uh, wrote the piece, and she, 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 put it, she put it like this. I mean, there's a lot to talk about in the article, uh, but she says, if cancellation, is a quote, quote, if cancellation means removal from a position of prominence on the basis of an ideological crime, it might appear that there's a case for canceling Aristotle." End quote. So is there such a case? If so, what is it? If Aristotle needs defending, what does a defense look like? And what's the wider significance of this issue of these calls to cancel prominent figures, particularly historical or intellectual cultural figures? So I'm Aaron Smith, and this is a Welcome to the New Ideal podcast. Joining me today is my colleague and fellow philosopher Ankar Gatte. Uh, welcome, Ankar. Hi, Aaron. Let me stop my screen share. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so there's, uh, a, I think, a lot to talk about that's interesting, uh, both in the article and the wider issue in the culture about. And I mean, as philosophers, we're particularly interested in uh, people of prominence. I think in the intellectual, philosophical, historical, cultural field, um, and. One of the things I'll just say at the outset, and then you, we'll just we'll get this conversation going. One thing is, at the, I'll say at the outset is, so um, the title of that opinion piece by uh, Professor Callard, uh, you know, should we cancel Aristotle? I mean, I should make clear that her view in the article, and that she says this, she's no, we shouldn't cancel Aristotle. And she makes a kind of a case, uh, a certain kind of defense of why we should continue to read Aristotle. He should stay on the syllabus and stuff. Um, but I have to find that they say that I found her defense of Aristotle miserable, like really, really poor. Um, and I find it hard if, if somebody was sympathetic to the idea that if, because basically she cites Aristotle's views about slavery, which he defended a form of slavery. Uh, and he had views about women, they're not men, the equal of men and so on. And she takes these to be uh, inegalitarian and, um, and so on. Um, and she's like, look, you could make a case that we should cancel him because of these views, they're very objectionable and so on. Um, but she says they shouldn't, he, we shouldn't do that. But the way in which she defends him, I think is so unphilosophical in many ways and, and weak that it's hard to find that if somebody was sympathetic to the ideal of taking somebody off a curriculum. Like, why would you defend this guy? I mean, it doesn't make any sense from the article. Um, yeah, I mean, you, we both read the article, but. Yeah, I, I agree, because some of the criticism of the article was, well, no one's saying we should get rid of Aristotle. And, but I'd add to that yet. Yeah. No one's saying that yet. If you, if you zoom out a little bit, just a little bit, just, and still focused on say classics departments, study of ancient history, ancient languages, ancient thinkers. Um, I mean, it, it's pretty well known, I think that in academia that these departments are shrinking. They're shrinking in terms of budget, they're shrinking in terms of faculty, and there's a kind of pressure, justify why you're here. And if this is what you get as a defense, like this is, well, we should still exist and we should be, still be teaching and students should, still should be learning this. And if you give this kind of defense that was given, it's disastrous. A, a, a weak defense is worse than none. Yeah. You're, it's better to just let Aristotle, Plato, and the ancient Greeks or ancient Romans speak for themselves. Like, read this and think, do you think it's valuable for students to read this or not? But if you're going to come in and offer a defense in this way, and it's so, I mean, we can talk about what is so weak about it, but that just, it suggests the field is ripe 
to be pushed out. Yeah. Okay. So this is someone sort of, because I view the article as preemptive. It's, so nobody's actually saying yet that we should wipe Aristotle out of the curriculum. Yeah. And so this is someone coming in trying to prevent that from happening. <laughs> and if this is the defense, you just encourage that, oh, maybe we should get rid of. If this is yeah. all there is to say about why students should read Aristotle, then why don't we get rid of them? I, I mean, it's almost like her, her case for the negative side was stronger than the positive side. So she says, so, so let's put a little meat on this. So she says, she makes the point that Aristotle defends, not only does he defend slavery, um, uh, I mean, he, well, let me put it this way. She, she puts it as Aristotle has this view where he comes, he has a philosophical defense for slavery. Uh, he has a, um, a conception that there's a, such a thing as a natural slave. Um, and that it's appropriate for the person to be in that relationship with a master and so on. Uh, and she said, well, this is really objectionable. And then his views of women and she has, they, they, they can't, their, their reason is, you know, not fully, uh, guide, uh, guide, what's it, action guiding in them and so on. Um, and she says, well, these are really inegalitarian and the, his, uh, and what's the word, illiberal, she puts it. Uh, and that this runs really deep in Aristotle's philosophy. And in contrast to somebody like Hume or Kant, which is who uh, made comments that people have taken as racist and so on, uh, he said, well, you can separate those out pretty easily from their core philosophy. But Aristotle is, is uh, it's embedded and so on. OK, well, that sounds bad. Uh, and she says, but we shouldn't cancel Aristotle, and here's why. And she gives two reasons. Well, technically three, but she gives two reasons. She said, here are the benefits of reading Aristotle. Um, he may have something into, in his ethics, a view about, you know, uh, being excellently virtuous and so on, uh, that's worthwhile and that we haven't really incorporated into our own moral perspective very well. Um, he may have that. And the other positive is it helps us, he can serve as a foil, uh, to help us better ground our own more egalitarian views. That's the benefit. There's a reason why Aristotle is one of the most significant, important figures in the history of thought in the world. Uh, in me, he has views on, I mean, he's grown and pushed the field of philosophy incredibly in terms of his development of the identification of the laws of logic, the founding of the, the both biology, the, the whole scientific method, even the notion of a science. I mean, he has the enormous achievements across the board and she takes something as well, the benefit of studying him as well. He might have this one view in ethics and then uh, uh, he's a good foil for our better views. I mean, that's basically just, it serves, and I don't think she meant to do this, but it serves it basically as just a smear, I think, to Aristotle, um, as if there's nothing else to offer. And yeah, <laughs> and even on those terms, <clears throat> It's so, so even if you thought Aristotle doesn't have that much to offer, the idea that he shouldn't be in the curriculum does not follow. So the, there's the, there's two things I think that it's important to distinguish. And in Aristotle's case, both are really relevant. So if you're thinking of the, like, why should this thinker be studied? Um, you can think, so one answer would be, because he's historically significant. And there's no uh, assumption, there's no suggestion that this person should be admired, uh, or let alone that you regard him as a great hero. So, I mean, if you said, should we, and I don't think in terms of cancel, uh, any yeah. kind of new notion that you don't really know, what is the referent? How would I define this? What does it include? What does it not include? So kind of cancel culture and so on. Yeah. I don't think in those terms, because I think these are deliberately vague terms that are meant to cloud thinking rather than to facilitate thinking. But if, you th if, if the issue is, should Aristotle be taught your answer can be yes, and you think Aristotle in, in the course of history is a bad influence. I mean, sh should Hitler and the Nazis be taught? I think, yeah, if you're teaching 20th century history, if you don't teach the rise of Nazism, if you're teaching 20th century world history, 
then it's, I mean, you're missing such a major, major, you can't understand World War II. It's a, and there's no presumption that, oh, if you're teaching it, it's for, it's because you admire it or something. It's, it can be a lesson from a negative perspective. This is what things look like when it goes really bad. So that's one issue about if you're thinking, should we teach this? What's its historical significance? Like, why is it important for students to know this? And that's not the same thing as students should admire this or something. They just should know about this. And then the second issue is you're putting someone on the curriculum because here's someone you can learn from. Um, here's something you should engage with. And you might even find the person heroic, as I think we both do in regard to Aristotle. I mean, I think he's one of the great heroes in history. Um, but it's here's something to learn from. And that's so you're you're it's different than saying, okay, study Hitler, here's something to learn lessons about what not to do. And here's study Aristotle, here's things you can learn in a positive sense. And you can't blur those two together. Now, for Aristotle, I think both apply. He's of historical significance. Even if you think he's a bad thinker, his views are all wrong, and so there's it's unquestionable the influence he's had in Western civilization. And if you're trying to understand history, including intellectual history, if you don't know about Aristotle, you can't understand Western history. Yeah. And I mean, part, in part, and this is the same goes for Plato, uh, in part because they defined the field in many ways and many of the terms in which, uh, and the arguments uh, and the framing that we think about these issues in. Um, but so uh, Khaled got some criticism in one of these other articles responding to this that uh, um, both what do you mean by what do you mean by cancel Aristotle? I mean, are you saying you're worried that they're going to completely remove him from the curriculum? Because they said that seems kind of implausible. Um, and in some sense, I think it is implausible in the sense that the departments across the country, I mean, he's, he's too important. It would just be too crazy. But uh, another possibility, though, uh, is that what people might start doing is when you teach Aristotle, you have to really emphasize uh, the whole, oh, it's his views on slavery, it's his views on women, as if that was his importance or significance, uh, it downplaying or, or spending a significantly less time on what I take to be his much more important uh, ideas. Um, and that's, that, that, I think, is plausible. Like, if you're going to teach Aristotle, and I can imagine their classics department saying, look, I mean, if you look at some of the statements on, uh, on race, diversity, inclusion, and so on, on many classics websites, um, some of them are kind of banal, but some of them are a little, I think, intellectually chilling, um, you know, in terms of what they support and what they agree with and, and yeah. The self-abasement, I think, that goes on on some of these two is we're complicit in systemic racism and the whole field of classics is shot through with racism and we have a commitment to, and you know, if, you, if your own department is saying things like this, there's a real worry that if I'm teaching Aristotle, that if I, I, if I, look, if I don't deal with the politics, I mean, the issue of slavery comes up in, you know, book one of the politics uh, and other areas in the politics, mm -hmm. but it comes up and but if i'm not teaching politics i mean like when i teach aristotle in university it's usually a part of it's either one of two things it's a it's a study of aristotle a seminar on aristotle or it's um part of a history of greek philosophy where you also teach some pre-socratics and plato and so on i don't bother putting that in it's not significant in in the kind of when you're looking at the sweep of ideas and the development of ideas across history yeah plato is super important aristotle is super important and sees metaphysics epistemologies ethics um I think, frankly, his politics is less important uh, from a philosophic perspective. So the idea that I would include his views on women, it's like it's not, it, it's so irrelevant compared to, in comparison to his other views. That just doesn't mean you cover things up, but like right. the, your views are, because it's, yeah, no, when we do talk about these things, but Aristotle is even more interesting on the question of slavery. If you read the sections in the politics about slavery, he's thinking about it. And one of the things I find interesting is, he is aware that there are some people who, are, who have argued um, that, that slavery is, um, uh, what's the word, uh, 
it's just something by convention. It's a human convention. It's not, it's not part of the order of nature, which, which gives it some kind, seems to give it some kind of justification. He says, there are some people who thinks it's always wrong, you know, and some, you know, and so, so let's dig into that. And what, what is the case and what would be the standards if somebody was properly thought to be appropriately a slave? And because Aristotle thought a lot of slavery in ancient Greece was unjust uh -huh. because the person had no business being a slave in the first place. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of subtlety and nuance in what his actual view is. I mean, you're dealing with a real thinker that's worth studying and not just to bring him up so you can condemn it. And that is part, so the Kayard article, if I'm pronouncing that right. Um, yeah, Callard. Callard. I, I mispronounce almost everybody's name. So I never <laughs> object when people mispronounce mine because I, I do. Um, one, I, I mean, I really found it, the whole article, um, unbelievable in the sense that the, you're, you're preemptively raising how to defend Aristotle. And this is your defense. And she's and, a professor of ancient Greek philosophy. Yeah. So it's not, it's even her field. Yeah. And one aspect is what you're bringing up now is that she says, well, we can treat Aristotle in effect like an alien who we're not going to talk about his motivations, why he might be holding these views. We're just going to treat it like he's had these, he has these views and he advances some reasons and that work is what we're going to look at. And if you were really thinking about the issue of slavery or views about men and women, so Aristotle's really interesting because if you're, if you're looking at his whole corpus, I don't think you can find someone in the history of thought who has the devotion and concern for the truth that Aristotle has, that you don't read Aristotle and think he's got an agenda. You read Aristotle as this is the first scientist in the West that everything subordinate is their evidence and arguments for a view. And he goes through many other thinkers views and he looks at history of the past views and like what were their arguments and what evidence did they bring? And is there a reason to think there's some aspect that's right here, but some wrong. And so it's through and through methodologically that it's, I'm on a quest for truth. And if you really take that seriously, then one thing should be in one thing that should be interesting about the slavery views of women and so on is here you've got someone devoted to the pursuit of truth. And yet from 2000 years plus in the future, you think he still got things wrong. And that should make it seem that should at least raise the question maybe these issues aren't obvious and maybe it's a real achievement to think no slavery is wrong everywhere and we can abolish it that it's possible to have political organization and a real civilization without slavery which i think is a modern achievement and same in terms of thinking about women to think what is a possible place and so rather than thinking it's all obvious it's you should get the perspective no, none of it's obvious. Even one of the greatest thinkers from a perspective of way, way in the future, you think, no, this isn't exactly right. Um, but the way people are taught about history now, and particularly any moral aspect is it's so anachronistic. It's so, and, it, and it's, um, it's delusional in this sense that it, they take it as obvious. Yeah, if you put me in the past, I'd be opposed to slavery. I'd be opposed to the way women are treated. I'd be advocating for individual rights and the US constitution and so on. You don't know anything about this. And the idea that you would come up with all of this, it's Ridiculous. such a fantasy and it's a real disservice to students for, for them to think that. Yeah, and, and another thing that really bothers me <laughs> about this is, so she brings up David Hume and Immanuel Kant, uh, other philosophers. And so she starts out in the article by listing all of Aristotle's ideological sins, so to speak. Uh, and she says, well, this is that perspective on, uh, on human beings is, is a little clo more closer tied to some of his other views and so on. But if you take someone like Kant, 
okay, so he made some racist remarks or whatever, um, but it's a little less tied to his fundamental views. And so that, that's no big deal. Kant destroyed the enlightenment. <laughs> it's like Aristotle made it possible. I mean, it was one of the figures who made it possible, whose views about reason and logic and science and this worldly study and this worldly concern about our lives and our virtues and everything. This is, he's a titan in that regard. And yeah, he got some things wrong, but there's this little checklist that if you go wrong on, uh, on women, slavery, or who knows what, it's that, that oh, that's, what, that's what counts, right? Uh, and that's bizarre. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's an Kant put forward check. a view that, you know, that ended people's confidence in reason's ability to understand the world and organize our affairs. Uh, and you've got philosophies of ira growing, growing <clears throat> irrationalism coming out of this and it's like so but he gets a pass i mean i'm not suggesting you <laughs> cancel kant but it's but again for kant I mean, <clears throat> he's one of the people the distinction i made earlier between should he be part of the curriculum and should he be a figure that you revere yeah. i don't revere kant i think he's an enemy as you said he destroys the he's the central figure in bringing the enlightenment to an end philosophically um, and that is, makes him a villain in my books. But is he of importance in terms of the history of philosophy, history of ideas, and more broadly understanding the history that comes after, not just intellectual history, but actual history and, and political developments, cultural developments? Is Do you have to know Kant and what he argued, why he argued, who he's arguing against, um, why he thought the the previous arguments are inadequate and vulnerable and he's said okay so we need a whole new view indeed he said it it's a you need a revolution in philosophy so that if you're trying to understand things you have to know about kant so the idea that you can't oh when a, because he's a villain we're not going to put him in the curriculum it's okay well you're not educating anybody about um what really matters if you take him out uh i mean i i ran called kant the most evil person in the world and yet she would not have thought, okay, so you don't teach them. Yeah. Um, and that's partly what's, <clears throat> partly what's scary about this is that it's one thing, it would be totally wrong, but it would be one thing is if you thought, well, look how horrible this philosophy is, we shouldn't teach it, it's, which is bad enough. Um, but it's another thing to have um, a little list of things that in the grand scheme, in terms of the, uh, in terms of philosophy, philosophic systems and development are not to minimize them as issues, but in that context, kind of side issues, they're, they're minor issues. Uh, and that that is the criterion for now evaluating historical figures. Um, I think is really dangerous too, because it, it's, 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 I think it's in the end kind of unintellectual. It's certainly unphilosophical. Um, and by unphilosophical, I mean, it's just, it's a failure to grasp the significance of foundational issues in, in the field um, and bringing, making minor issues to the curriculum. And I don't mean that slavery or well, one's views of women are minor issues. They're not minor issues, but to make that the criterion for how you evaluate a philosopher and his role and his significance uh, is just crazy. Yeah, it's, it, you put it, it's a checklist mentality it's and it's an irrational checklist and it's an immoral check it's a dogmatic checklist is one way to put it we've got our dogma through now which we're going to look at everything and we're going to per it's like a purge yeah. and we're going to purge things and we've seen that mentality with the nazis and we've seen that with the communists and there's an element of that in at least some of these calls and you can see that particularly and i noticed some people in, in the, on the YouTube chat brought this up, that if you were taking seriously moral evaluation of historical um, figures and historical movements and so on, all the people, and it's a huge number, connected to communism and socialism and fascism, you would have, like, why are we teaching Marx? Um, He's, he's responsible or partly responsible for worldwide bloodshed. And he actually is in the, versus Aristotle. And yet I would say you keep him in the curriculum for 
for the same reason you keep Kant in the curriculum. But there's no such perspective like that, that there, there's debates about that kind of thing. And the, you sent me an article about, uh, I think it was a university at Edinburgh, that they just removed David Hume from, uh, from the name of a building. Yeah. For, for the reasons that he had, he has some connection to uh, slavery and not thinking the races are equal. Uh, which is, which is, I mean, it's true. Like Hume had, this is part, it's part of his view. He's not on a crusade for this and so, but it is part of what he wrote. You take him off. And one of the suggestions was to, I forget now who it was, but it was to put up a dictator from the colonial period of Tanzania. And it's, it's, and then people brought up, well, this person's a dictator. And it, so, oh, we and won't. Maybe dictator wasn't what triggered it. He was also a homophobe. And maybe oh, that's, that's, that's probably what triggered it. <laughs> but nonetheless. Yeah, that, that may well be. But he happened. was a dictator, yeah. Um, but, it, <clears> and it's, it's that, it's that kind of selective perspective that tells you that there's something morally really wrong here as well. Yeah. Yeah, and, you know, we you brought up the point that, you know, some people are saying, well, come on, nobody's, there's no campaign to get rid of Aristotle from the curriculum. Uh, and you, you mentioned that Callard's piece is preemptive. It's like, I'm, I'm doing what I can, uh, <laughs> however badly, doing what I can to try to prevent or, you know, make sure this doesn't happen. But the thing with the Hume is just, no, it's happening. So, okay, this is the name of a building. Um, but, I mean, this is also happening. I mean, the whole statues issue is related to this. It's toppling, <clears throat> toppling figures because they miss the, they go wrong on the checklist. Yes. And, and partly it's like, why is the, the, the building named after David Hume? He's a famous alumnus and he's a super famous philosopher. Uh, and not because he had some view about the races and so on. I mean, that's, that's a tangential issue in his own thought. It's yeah. because of his philosophic significance, his historical significance, significance. Um, that, I mean, this is why he's being honored. I mean, Dave, he's a brilliant philosopher who helped shape subsequent philosophy, you know, for better or for worse in various areas. Yeah. So that's another kind of dimension that is not talked or not thought about enough. Um, so it is, if you're putting his name on a building, it is to not just, he's part of the curriculum. It's, there's an acknowledgement of some kind of achievement there. So there's a celebration. It's not like, I would object if someone named a building after Hitler. Um, so it is, a, it's a positive here, but then you have to ask the question of look, what is the achievement that is the, it, this is in recognition of, and is there a real achievement there? And for Hume, I think, yes, there unquestionably is a real achievement there. And it's, again, it's easy to think, um, yeah, if I were in that part of history, I mean, in that period of history, with the knowledge they had, and so not taking all the knowledge I have in the, from the 21st century back with me, um, what would my views have been? And of, of these people crusading to let's get these people out off the curriculum or not as prominent in the curriculum and so on, my view of most of them is you would be pro-slavery when slavery was mainstream, because you're just echoing mainstream views. It's like the, the of, for taking Hume off, his name off the statue, it's, yeah, we'll put up this other person. And why, like, what makes that other person acceptable? Well, he seems mainstream. He was anti-colonial, helped liberate Tanzania and so on. And no independent thinking of, yeah, but was this he a monster nevertheless? Like, was he a dictator? It's just, this is the received view, so I'm following it. And then someone brings up, and that's that's, that's the exactly, kind of mentality. Yeah. Slavery was mainstream for centuries and centuries and centuries and had intellectual arguments in favor of it. So, And most of these people would be, my view is they would be pro-slavery. And it's, you have to, I, like, I'm not sure what I would be. You like to think you would have be against it and so on, but it's Aristotle. I mean, this is part of the relevance for knowing that someone like Aristotle had arguments like this. This is one of the greatest minds in recorded history. And he, he didn't get it all right. So the idea that it's just, yeah, I, if I was there, I would have got it all right is bizarre. Yeah. yeah. And it, 
even even going back to his views of slavery, it's I think the way he formulated um, when it was appropriate to for someone to be enslaved by some other person helped to undermine the case for slavery. I don't think he was intending to do that, but it's the only case in which it's appropriate for one human being to be enslaved by another human being is when one of the human beings, the person, the slave, is incapable of deliberating, incapable of rational deliberation. Like he can't project his own goals, his own future. He can listen, he can understand somebody who's rational enough to be able to follow orders or to be able to do some tasks, but the person is actually incapable of projecting their long range interests, of thinking about what their values are, of guiding their life. You might think of somebody, I mean, if you're looking for an actual example, you might think of somebody who's so damaged, like their brain is damaged so much, for example, that they literally can't function. I mean, you can say, go do this, and they're okay, I can do that. But And then, then his view was in that kind of case, if there are such cases, and he did think there were, I don't know what those cases would be, but he, he did think there were such cases. But if that were the person's position, it's a beneficial relationship to be in a, a person where the master is in effect providing for them and basically in giving them instructions. And then they are, the, so the, 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 what do you want to call it, defective, whatever. This person is, it, it's a symbiotic relationship. Mm -hmm. I help you, uh, you provide for certain things and needs and you help me because I can't think. So it just raises the question, yeah, but are there any, really anybody like that? And if you say, if that's the only condition for when it's appropriate, uh -huh. like someone's a natural slave, like they're natural, it's, yeah, I don't see anybody like that. And if you try to, if you try to pin a certain race or group or something as, oh yeah, that's them. They're the natural slaves. You just take one case, like this takes like one, one this doesn't even require experimentation. Mm -hmm. Take one case, you raise them in a different environment, you educate them, you're like, oh, that's it. That, that's just false. And so I think that, uh, I mean, I'm not a historian on the issue of the race and how these ideas develop and so on, but if that's your criteria, and he says all other forms of slavery are unjust because the person has a re has reason and they can think and plan for their own lives. So there's all sorts of slavery in ancient Greece. You, it, generally, it was you get caught in war. Yeah. So somebody got defeated and you capture the prisoners and the rationale is you have choices. I can either kill you because, you know, this is war or you can agree to work for me in perpetuity um, and I won't kill you. And given that choice, <laughs> okay, well, you know, and so that, but he he, he figured it's, it's not, that's not a form of just slavery. That's a form of legalized slavery. But if the person is capable of thinking on, on their own for their life, it's not. Uh, and that is, I think, a thinker's perspective on this issue that's interesting. And it doesn't mean, oh, that's the right way to look at it, but that's, it, it's, it's less crazy, I think, than with the way it's often presented. It's oh, is everybody's a natural slave and so on. But. Yeah. Uh, let, why don't we talk a little bit about one last issue and then turn to some of the questions. And I think I, I see Stefan asked on the super chat, a, a good question. We can take that up in a moment. So thanks for that. And, um, and we have some questions in Zoom as well. Uh, and that's, so not a comprehensive, but what would be some of the things to highlight about why the study of the classics more broadly, so if we broaden it from Aristotle, oh, we can talk a little bit about Aristotle in particular. I mean, we have talked a bit about that, but the classics more generally, like what is the positive value in learning about this. And I, so I think there's at least two, I would single out two major ones. So one is to understand the history of the West, the history, both its intellectual history and uh, more broadly, its political cultural history. You have to know about major achievements that the Greeks and Romans made because many of the later achievements build on that. And even if, say, you're trying to learn US history and the, the, the birth of a new nation, so if you don't know that they studied the ancient world to a considerable degree and thought about its political developments, its political ideas, how those ideas played out, 
what's good that we can emulate, what's bad that we, what mistakes and, and pitfalls are we trying to avoid? And so you can understand the thinking that went into the birth of the United States, just to take one example, sort of that's US centric. So that's one element. And then two is you have so many um, thinkers who are world caliber, who are making major discoveries. And it, that's true in philosophy, it's true in mathematics. Aristotle is a philosopher and a scientist. I mean, Darwin admired his, bio, his biological works. And I think there's a lot to learn about methodology, what it means to think, what it means to collect observations. But I mean, he's, you can take the historians, uh, um, uh, Herodotus, Thucydides. I mean, there's so, so there's so much rich knowledge to learn. And, and it's interesting, and I think it's valuable to, to get sort of other mindsets. And one of the things that I find really valuable is to get the a Western mindset pre-Christianity. And to see what that looks like um, and what was possible that, uh, I mean, the, the kind of apologist for religion now is everything depends on religion. So it's to see like, what is it, or, and particularly Christianity in the US, it's a, to look what it looked like when people looked at the world, not through a Christian lens. Yeah. And also, so in that regard too, it's, uh, and I think as a result of uh, the heavy influence of Christianity, it's hard to look at the field of ethics or morality uh, in, uh, in a way that's not deeply affected. And if, I think effective in ways people aren't even aware yeah. uh, that that is how they frame the issue. It's how they think about it. And they may reject the idea of a God, but they're still think of it as it's about sacrifice for other people. It's about service and to confront the Greeks it's to confront a somewhat alien perspective from that. I mean, they're, they're not altruists. I mean, there are some elements where that, that it's sort of, sort of there, but uh, it's predominantly the, the approach to ethics from Greece is what's the best life possible and how to live it? Uh, what's the most enviable life? Like what and how to build it? Uh, and if that's the case, and like who thinks of ethics like that? Nobody thinks of ethics like that, basically. Uh, and that was be because of the, the influence of Christianity and the altruism and so on. But the other, I mean, other reasons, I mean, I th think it, ancient Greece or the kind of Greco-Roman world, it's an intellectual culture. Uh, like you said, on every level, everything from theater, even their body kind of comedies uh, in terms of their theater and stuff uh, are intellectual uh, in a way like Aristophanes or something. It's an intellectual culture. Uh, and there's an enormous respect for reason uh, among the philosophers there. Um, and I mean, to, and even moving from Aristotle to Plato, I actually teach more Plato than I do Aristotle. I think for, there's various reasons for that. <laughs> I mean, I think Aristotle's, uh, philosophy uh, is significantly more true uh -huh. than Plato's, but Plato is a genius, you know, capital G. Um, and he's really brilliant. And one of the reasons of studying Plato, I mean, it's like we teach, uh, well, I'll be teaching a unit in the Objectivist Academic Center uh, here at ARI on Plato. And one of the main reasons I do it is this is what it looks like to grapple with philosophic issues. Uh, and he's really good at that. And he challenges his own views and often because they're done, in, they're, they're kind of written in term, form of conversations and so on. Um, you get people objecting and what it looks like to really wrestle with an issue when the answer isn't clear. Like you don't know the answer in advance and I'm just going to walk you through the steps uh, like a teacher might use a Socratic, so to speak, method. But where you're trying to figure out what's true. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's excellent at that. And he, he made uh, an enormous strides, I think, in, in philosophy. And it's like, again, um, encounter with thinkers of that caliber, I think, is really instructive. And not just because you just take on their conclusions. Uh, right. You watch their thought and you think along with them. And, and it's not even st stuck with cl the classics. The same is true with Hume. You read somebody, someone like Hume or you read somebody like Descartes. These are super smart people. Um, and once you get aside, well, I don't like those conclusions and this is wrong. And, but you start following their thought process. How, how do you arrive at conclusions like this? What's the reasoning? Is there a case for this? Uh, in that respect, uh, 
I mean, you study them because they're great thinkers. Yeah. So there's, yeah, there's a lot to learn. And it, yeah. that's part of the, I think, I mean, we both had a really negative uh, reaction to the, should we cancel Aristotle op-ed in the New York Times? And it's from the perspective, what it makes it sound like is, you're not going to learn much from Aristotle, but let's keep him in anyway. Like yeah. It's, yeah, and what's funny is, so in the, in the, uh, the online edition of this article, I think, came out first, and the title was, Should We Cancel Aristotle? And then when the print version came out, another editor, I think a different, maybe a junior editor, who knows who it was, changed the title for the print edition. Mm. And the title was, um, Aristotle is a jerk, but we shouldn't cancel him. <laughs> and I think that better captured what, was, what the article felt like yeah. in reading it. And I think the author was a little incensed. Well, maybe incensed. I think the author was a little annoyed at that because it, for various reasons, but uh, I think that actually better, that captured what was the, the stinger that's left in you. It's like, oh, let, let me trash Aristotle, though I don't think she was trashing Aristotle. But it's, let's say a whole bunch of, let's put right in people's faces a lot of stuff, uh, some things he got wrong on issues that really trigger people now. And then give some really weak reasons why we should keep him in the curriculum. And that's my defense. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why a, a weak defense is worse than none. It's yeah. worse to have an article that whose takeaway for is Aristotle's a jerk, but let's keep him in yeah. than to not have it at all. It's, yeah. it, it pushes people in the direction. Yeah, I guess maybe we should be asking why is he in the curriculum? Yeah. <clears throat> um, uh, okay, so why don't we turn now to some questions. Let's take this, uh, I said, we'll turn, Stefan's, so thanks again for the question and the contribution. Uh, so this is thinking a, a bit of the history of uh, philosophy after Aristotle. The question is, are there any good philosophers who were inspired or taught by Aristotle in ancient Greece? In ancient, well, I mean, he had a famous student, Theophrastus. Uh, well, famous. <laughs> he's famous to me. <laughs> um, he's not generally wi widely known, uh, but he is among people who study that period of philosophy, of course. Um, uh, who did uh, important work in the Aristotelian tradition. Um, but it's hard to trace. So in terms of students, uh, I don't know how many actual students you can trace uh, it with any clarity. Um, and if we're sticking to ancient Greece, um, his influence was hard to measure. Um, because if you look at the post Aristotelian, like uh, philosophy after Aristotle died, and you look like people like the, uh, some of the skeptics or Stoics or Epicureans, it looks like you can see some kinds of echoes here and there, a little in Epicurus, and it's so, but that's it's not prominent. I mean, he had a school in, in Athens, um, and so did these other philosophic uh, persuasions and so on. Um, I mean, you have to look a little later on uh, in the sort of Greek world, people like Alexander of Aphrodisias, um, you know, uh, who's written some good things as well. Um, but it's not, here's his prominent student, and then he went out and did all these things. And we don't know a whole lot uh, about their views. I mean, some of the, like Theophrastus, is, he has some of his work still survive in some form. Uh, Usually and it is quoted the, by somebody else, like Simplicius, who's quoted by somebody else who's quoted by somebody. Else. Is is the what's come down and what's been preserved in sort of the historical record is the view that there was a lot of work that's been lost by students of Aristotle, or is that even unknown? I'm not sure. I haven't really studied that. I mean, so uh, now I'm now okay. Now I'm speaking totally off the cuff here, just off memory, so this might not be exactly right. But um, Theophrastus wrote a number of works, and particularly he wrote, I think, a treatise on the senses, a different philosophers' perspectives on the senses, I think, looking back toward ancient Greece and so on, and I think made some uh, innovations on his own, if I remember right. Um, but I think, again, totally just this from memory, so I shouldn't even say it, but uh, I think a lot of that is preserved by other commentators who had access to sources, and they would quote them in large portions, but I, I could be wrong about that. Uh, okay, let's take another question. This was from Andrew on Zoom. It's how similar to this, to, to sort of the phenomenon we're talking about around Aristotle, the classics, uh, 
how similar is it to the founding fathers? So it, the question is, there are sort of a statement question. They have been attacked uh, for their flaws and they ignore the good about them. Throwing the baby out with the bathwater sounds like the same pattern with w w the phenomenon we're talking about. So I would say, um, so I think there is an element of it's a focus only on real or perceived flaws of the founding fathers. So there is that element in, in our cultural debates of people who do that. It's, they're focused only on the flaws and some are real and some are not real of what the flaws that they're pointing to and not looking at the wider achievements. And again, thinking very anachronistically. So thinking, oh yeah, like it, it should have been obvious what to do about slavery and, and all and what the status of women should be. So that all of this is obvious and we can talk a little bit about why the kind of philosophical views that would make it seem like it would be obvious. But th there's that element. But I would say this. So you brought up about Aristotle that if you're thinking of Aristotle as a thinker and how he would think of himself or what is he doing? Like he's a pioneer in so many different fields. If you asked him, is what's essential about what you're doing, your view about slavery and about women? It's like, no, I mean, you've missed every, my, my whole life career, you've missed if that's what you think is what, whereas for the founding fathers, slavery is a more central issue because they're thinking about the, if we're talking about the founding fathers, the, the, the fathers of the creation of the United States, this is a political issue. They're thinking about a new nation and they're grappling with the issue of slavery. So if you're really teaching these people their thinking and their actions, slavery and their attitudes towards it, including did they own slaves? Did they change their views about slavery over the course of time? And if they did, like a Benjamin Franklin, what led to that? And so it's much more central. And if you take the Declaration of Independence, it's about the quality of all men. And how did they, how did they think about that in relation to the slaves? And then the Constitution and it's, well, the, it's some kind of compromise with the Southern states and so on. So it's much more central and it is, from that perspective, whitewashing. If you don't, if all you focus on is the achievements and, and sort of bracket the whole issue of slavery as though it wasn't intertwined with all of this, that is, that's a real whitewash. Yeah. And, and people tend to think sometimes that if you have someone who you think is really admirable, someone like Aristotle, that you have to defend every one of the views that they happen to hold or find some way of finessing it to make it, oh, it's a really okay. And you don't need to do that. Ayn Rand certainly never did that with Aristotle. I mean, she admired him. To, to say she admired him, I think is putting it really weakly. Um, but when she read, you know, uh, she was reading a book on Aristotle and come, comes across his views on slavery. And she's like, this is a dreadful quote. <laughs> like, oh my God, you know? So she doesn't, uh, she doesn't hold back. Uh, even when it comes to Aristotle, she doesn't try to rewrite it or whitewash it or anything at all. I mean, you identify what's true and good and you identify what's bad. Um, but I think it's significant that they go after Aristotle and not say Plato. Yeah, so uh, we had a question about that. So that's good. Oh, yeah. Pick up that. It, it, it asked it in the, in the original article, was there a discussion of Plato? No. Or just Aristotle? Yeah, no, no discussion of Plato. I mean, you know, you know, what Plato sets up is a, a, a society in which, and what she thinks is an I okay, that's a very complicated issue. Uh, what, he, he, what he puts forward is the view that what we need is uh, a society in which philosophers basically tell everyone what to do. They tell them uh, lies to keep them in line. I mean, it's a, he's, he, he constructed the whole philosophic framework uh, for defending and justifying all the way down to metaphysics. Uh, and epistemology to defending why uh, an authoritarian kind of regime. And there's all sorts of scholarly controversy about that issue, but it's that, it, okay. So he put the whole framework all the way down to, you know, some people are just born incapable of, uh, uh, of reason. And so they have to be simply told what to do. Um, he's the father of that sort of perspective. Uh, but no, nobody jumps on Plato. Not for that. I mean, everybody's okay with statism and collectivism uh, and the subordination of the individual to the group. Everybody's okay with that. So why would you go after Plato? Uh, 
And but Aristotle, I think it's also something that they he's a figure that's revered. I think that's one of the reasons why people go after them. Like nobody's going after uh, Seneca, for example. Uh, I mean, I think the Stoics had better views in many cases about the issue of slavery and how to think about that. Those, those are, those are their additional problems. But let me say Seneca owned slaves. I'm not saying he advocated the, the institution or anything, but it's, but nobody goes after him trying to topple his, his statue. He's not really at that level where it's, you're one of the greats that's really revered. Uh, and I think that's important. Uh, and I think that's also one of the reasons why the founders, I mean, they, you really get a lot of reverence from people. And I think that also draws the fire. Um, and it draws a nihilism too, that yeah. I want to smash yeah. the achievement. Yeah, if nobody cared about the person, there's no point smashing. Uh, okay, we have, why don't we take uh, another of the questions on YouTube. So Shazbot, thank you again for the, or thank you for the contribution. Let's say, let's, we have five minutes left, so let's make this the last uh, question, I think. Is cancel culture similar to the use of the memory hole from the novel 1984, or perhaps a baby step in that direction? Um, so let me say again, I said this earlier, that I don't think in terms of cancel culture, because when you give it a label like that, it suggests, okay, there's a phenomenon here that I know what it is. I know what I would classify as this is an instance or an aspect of cancel culture, and this isn't. And when you ask people about this, and when you see discussions about it, it's not clear even like what counts as an instance or example of cancel culture, what doesn't. This is part of the criticism, the original New York Times op-ed on, on the issue of Aristotle brought, like what does it even mean to in quotes cancel someone? Like, and, but if, if you ask, uh, so the, the memory hole, the, is it of movements that push in the direction of totalitarianism? is one of the things they want to control history. I think the answer to that is yes. That you learn a tremendous amount, for, if you do history properly, you learn a tremendous amount of what is good and what is bad. And one, I mean, if you take, so it's bringing up 1984 and the socialism, communism, totalitarianism kind of view, uh, though it would be put, I think, more as communism. You can even question if that is true of 1984, but it, this, it is, if you're able to rewrite history, the lessons people draw from history will be wrong. Um, and if you think from communism's perspective, the lesson from history, and this is pre uh, the foundation of the, of the Soviet revolution, it's certainly post that. History teaches you that communism doesn't work. But I think you could have known that in the early 20th century, that the abolish private property, have one all powerful one party rule that somehow is going to wither away 50 years from now. So all of that was a fantasy. And I think you could have known that. And I mean, a young Ayn Rand, I think, knew this is BS, basically. Um, and his, but it's, if you think of what the founding fathers studied and so on, they studied history in part to create the United States. So, that you have a proper view of history, you draw the right lessons. And so that is an important part of a good culture, I think. And so the, that there's wars about history, sort of cultural wars, I don't think is an accident. It is really important what to think about history. And from that perspective, it is, I mean, this is part of the distinguishing between knowing something about history and who you should venerate in history if you don't know just about history, what actually happens, what ideas have been tried and so and failed, and so um, you're ripe for all kinds of political uh, solutions that are anything but solutions. Yeah, and the idea too that I mean, one of the things that it's commonly done is the control of who's taught and how. Uh, so that you can control the narrative. I mean, that, that's, uh, that's common in, also in authoritarian regimes as well, that people moving toward, look, there's a party line and there's a way in which you have to teach these people and there's the things you have to emphasize and people you can't talk about, or if you do, you have to, you have to slam them. Uh, and that's what you're gonna do. And this is what students are gonna learn. It's a kind of a politicized 
uh, these are the bad guys, you know, these were the people that got it all wrong and you should hate them. Uh, and that's, that's not even, I mean, to say it's non-objective is, is yeah. very nice. <laughs> um, and I think, unfortunately, this is what has happened with the slavery issue. It's, uh, it's, it, it's to, to most of the students I interact with who haven't sort of put an effort to, to learn something other than the mainstream, think slavery is basically was in the United States. And, oh, it was in the ancient world. It was in Africa. It was in the Arab world. It is. Yeah, it is. And it, it, it's, huh? Like it's, they, yeah. that's unfortunately, I think, deliberate in the educational system. It's, and it's not every educator who right, talks right. about slavery. And so, but there's too much of a push that it's, they think they know about the history and slavery and they don't know anything and it really skews then their views in the present because they've been so badly taught yeah okay we're at the we're at hour the, uh so yeah. you want to yeah if you want to i mean if you're enjoying these kinds of talks that we have uh i mean go ahead and subscribe uh, uh to our youtube channel and you can also uh uh you can you click the bell, right? Click the little red bell. Uh, if you want to get notifications of whenever we got a video coming out. Uh, and that's basically it, right? So yeah. we will see you uh, next week. Thanks a lot for joining me, Ankar. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Thanks, everyone, right. for joining Thanks, me. everyone, for coming.